This was Al Shifa Hospital around a week ago. Israeli tanks in the courtyard. These are the ruins they left behind. Israeli forces today pulling out after a massive and deadly raid. <laughs> Palestinians wandered amongst the debris of what used to be Gaza's biggest hospital, searching for dead bodies. Officials here claim 400 people were killed. Israel claims to have killed more than 200 militants. <laughs> Medics here had been struggling to care for a population ravaged by war and hunger. Patients describe a horrific ordeal during Israel's two-week-long assault on the compound. They let in a very small amount of food that was not enough. We were 150 patients and 50 members of medical staff. Journalists working with us filmed brother and sister Rafiq and Rafif in Al Shifa last month. Both had legs amputated following an Israeli strike that killed their mother and their siblings. Today, a video update on social media and what they've been through. They tortured us there, left us for five days without food or drink. We really suffered and we were living in torture. There was no medical treatment for our wounds and no food. The neglect towards us was awful, especially the absence of doctors. We suffered greatly. Amongst the grim discoveries made this morning, dead bodies strewn across the ground, some apparently showing signs of their limbs having been tied. With much of Gaza reduced to rubble, and practically the entire population displaced. Hospitals like Al Shifa had become shelters for families forced out from their homes. Facing snipers, Israeli soldiers and tanks, we evacuated, hoping to come back and find our belongings. I've nothing left. My house was bombed and everything has gone. I have nothing left. I sought shelter at schools, but they told me there was no space for me. Where do I go? This isn't the first time the Israeli army has targeted Al Shifa. Last year, it alleged it was serving as a Hamas command and control center. It took it over, then withdrew, without having shown evidence of that. Two weeks ago, soldiers moved in again, announcing they had seized weapons and killed senior operatives. Despite international criticism, Israeli officials insist the operation was a success and that they protected patients. Foreign journalists aren't allowed into Gaza to investigate on the ground ourselves. Over the past week, our forces operated there outstandingly. Shifa has become a central terrorist headquarters for Hamas. Our forces surprise action was carried out with precision. They killed more than 200 terrorists, among them senior commanders. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who's recovering from a hernia operation, is under increasing political pressure. Last night, thousands of Israelis took to the streets, calling for him to step down and for the government to reach a deal securing the release of the more than 100 hostages still held in Gaza. But even amongst the demonstrators, support for the Israeli military remains high. We have to be realistic that the Israeli public is not clamoring for peace and negotiations and concessions and a two-state solution. The problem that Israelis are expressing is that they doubt the government has clear, uh, sufficiently clear war aims. They are very aware that the government won't uh, discuss next day plans and they are concerned about global isolation. But none of all of these disparate pieces don't exactly add up to a call to end the war. In Gaza, Israel's war continues. Less than a third of all hospitals in the territory are working at all. Around 33,000 people have been killed, the majority civilians. And Israel's government is vowing to push ahead with an invasion of the southernmost city of Rafah. More suffering lies ahead. Sekunder Kamani. Well, in the last few hours, Iran has announced one of its senior Quds Force commanders has been killed in an Israeli airstrike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. It adds pressure to talks that are expected between US and Israeli officials on what happens next in Gaza. Kate Fisher is in Washington for us. Kate, 
What's the latest? Well, those talks are taking place uh, virtually as we speak. They were, of course, supposed to be in person, but Benjamin Netanyahu cancelled them last week in protests as when the U.S. refused to veto a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. But the White House says it welcomes how quickly they could restart them. And now, of course, they have something new to address. This airstrike uh, in Syria, in, in Damascus, uh, destroying the Iranian embassy there and crucially killing a senior Revolutionary Guard commander, as well as we think at least six other people. Uh, the Syrians have condemned this, saying that it will Israel will not destroy the alliance between Iran and Syria. The US say they are aware of it, they're looking into it. Very little information coming from them say they, they are not at the moment even confirming the death of this commander or the fact that Israel was behind it. But they do say there is no reason to suggest it will impact hostage negotiations. Of course, the US still involved in trying to get the those Israeli hostages out of Gaza. Uh, this comes on the back of several Israeli-backed airstrikes uh, in Syria in recent times, and it just shows that Israel is not afraid to up the ante against Iran, despite all the tensions in the region at the moment. Kate, thank you. Well, Elliot Abrams is a former deputy national security advisor under George W. Bush and supervised U.S. policy in the Middle East for the White House. He also worked as U.S. special representative for Iran under Donald Trump. And he, he joins me now from uh, Washington. Now, that, that strike that uh, Kate was just talking about on the uh, Iranian consulate in Damascus, Iran says the response will be harsh. Now, you've dealt with Iran. What do you take that to mean? Not much. <clears throat> uh, they say things like that all the time. They said it after the United States um, killed uh, the head of the IRGC, Ghassan Soleimani. Um, but they are usually very sensible, frankly, logical uh, about what they do next. So I don't think it tells us much about how they will respond. OK, well, let, let's move on to al-Shifa and what's been going on on the ground uh, in Gaza. Now, you presumably, much of the world, have seen those horrific images from what was a hospital. I mean, when you look at those pictures, what do you see? There's a record here going back years and years of the Hamas use of schools and hospitals and even mosques for military purposes, which makes them military targets under international law. If the Israelis are right in saying that they captured 200 Hamas and Islamic Jihad soldiers in Shifa, then what we are seeing is something we've seen since October 7th, which is Hamas doesn't care about the people of Gaza, and it turns them into targets by using civilian premises, hospitals, mosques, schools, for military purposes. But what we also... The result is, terrible. The result is what we just mm. saw. But what we also know is that members of the Biden administration and President Biden himself are not comfortable with the way Israel is conducting this campaign. Are the scenes from al-Shifa not yet more reasons why the Biden administration does not want Israel to go in on a major military offensive to Rafah? That's what the talks are about today, isn't it? I think the talks are more about how Israel goes in, actually, <clears throat> and how civilians can be removed from the fighting area and protected. You know, something like 85% of the people in Israel, maybe higher, and it's right to left, realize or believe that they're going to have to do something about Rafah or Hamas will survive. And if Hamas survives as a military and governing force mm. in Gaza, the war will never end or there'll never be peace. But it, I mean, I know you, you don't agree with everything the Biden administration is saying and doing regarding Israel, but President Biden has said this is a red line stopping the offensive in Rafah. Prime Minister Netanyahu says it's a red line going into Rafah. Now, one of those men is going to lose face. I, I think you're not quite right on what President Biden said, because I think what he said was, it's a red line to go in unless civilians can be moved out of the fighting. Civilians can be largely protected. And uh, that is why there's been a delay, or it's one of the reasons why there's been a delay on the Israeli part. There are other reasons, military well, 
what, what, but what are they talking about, though? Because Netanyahu has said that, that he's already approved a plan, including evacuation and humanitarian assistance. So if that is the case, what's left to discuss? That plan is what's left to discuss. That is, he may have approved a plan. That doesn't mean that President Biden will accept the plan and, and you know, and stamp it approved. So there's plenty to discuss. What is the Israeli plan? Is it any good? Will the United States go along with it or ask for many changes in it? And what's the timing? That's another question. So okay. there's plenty to talk about. Elliot Abrams, thank you so much for speaking with us.